Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us for today's program. I'm Erin Greenwald, Vice President of Public Programs at the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities and Editor-in-Chief of 64 Parishes Magazine. I'm so pleased to welcome you to the second program in our 2021 season of Bright Lights Online, Conversations with 2021 Humanities Awards winners. For the last 36 years, the LEH Humanities Awards have honored the culture bearers, humanists, filmmakers, photographers, and more who provide access to and interpret Louisiana history and culture. We are proud to share their stories and explore their contributions select Fridays in June and July through Bright Lights Online. In today's Bright Lights Online conversation, we'll hear from documentary photographer of the year, Abdul Aziz, and filmmaker and comedian, CJ Hunt. The Documentary Photographer of the Year Award honors photographers whose work captures Louisiana history, culture, and or peoples. Today's conversation is being recorded and streamed via Facebook Live using Zoom webinar. If you have a question you'd like answered during the Q&A period, please use the Q&A function, which is located at the bottom of your screen, not the chat window. You can type in your question there, and we will try to have that addressed at the end of the program during audience Q&A. We've also enabled closed captioning for today's program. To activate the closed captions on your device, locate the CC icon at the bottom of your Zoom toolbar at the bottom of your screen, click it and select sh show subtitles. And now I'm delighted to welcome our guests for today's program. Abdul Aziz, a New Orleans-based freelance photographer, is the LEH's 2021 Documentary Photographer of the Year. For nearly two decades, Aziz has worked to document conflict, war, social issues, and culture spanning the globe from the Middle East and Africa to the far reaches of the Himalayas, and more recently right here in our own backyard, New Orleans. His photos have been published by opinion-leading news agencies worldwide, and his work has focused recently on the rise of white nationalism in the United States and the removal of Confederate monuments in cities at the center of the debate, including New Orleans and Charlottesville. C.J. Hunt is a comedian, filmmaker, and field producer on The Daily Show with Trevor Noah. He served as a staff writer for A&E's Black and White and a field producer for BET's The Rundown with Robin Thede. Hunt is a fellow with New America and Firelight Media's Doc Lab. During C.J.'s eight years living in New Orleans, he began making a short film about monument removal. That short film has since evolved into the feature length documentary, The Neutral Ground, which airs nationwide July 5th on PBS. Welcome to you both. Thanks so much, Aaron. Thank you for, um, thank you for having me. Aziz, how you living? I'm good, brother. How are you? Good to see your face. <laughs> I'm good, I'm good. It's good to see your face too. What a, what, a what a wonderful, strange format that I know people are watching, but I feel like it's just you and me, baby. I know. Hey, that's the best for me. That way I have no idea what's going on externally and my nerves can be calm. So. Oh, yeah. I, I always feel calm when I see your face. It's really nice to see you. Well, that's good to hear. I'm glad it's not terrifying. <laughs> Guys, what if this was the whole hour? Just us being like, I love you. I miss you. I love exactly you. Right, exactly right. <laughs> um, exactly. Well, thank you, uh, Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities, for uh, having me and having this conversation today. Um, I also want to thank you for acknowledging the truth. Uh, you know, it's important to acknowledge the truth these days. And the truth is Aziz is one of the, um, I think, country's most influential and best photographers. I say countries. I don't say Louisiana. And I say Louis <laughs> Aziz is required to shake his head right now. That's what, that's what happens when you're getting compliments. And I think um, we need a word for national treasure, but for a state. State treasure sounds like like a Nicolas Cage B movie, but you know, you are, you are a regional tre regional <laughs> treasure doesn't even sound good. But I think in terms of, you know, folks like me who, who have lived in New Orleans, who have been living elsewhere, I think looking at your work makes me feel uh, rooted and um, aware of joy and struggle uh, and, and the fight for justice in a way that I think is really remarkable. So, um, so let's all in our homes, clap it up uh, at your computer for Aziz. Thank you, CJ. That's way too kind. Yeah. <laughs> of an yes. Um, I think your I think your work is urgent, and I think um, 
and, and it's just an honor to be able to have this time to talk to you about it. Um, I know Aziz because uh, I have a movie um, called The Neutral Ground that is finally done. Um, Aziz is featured in that movie because um, we, we did some work together that we'll talk about. Um, but I want to begin here of Aziz, I felt comfortable, not comfortable, but I felt as safe as one could be going to Charlottesville with you hmm. in 2017 in our film because I knew that you were a war photographer. So I didn't really ask questions about what does that mean that you're a war photographer I was just like okay okay so you've been you've been in it um mm -hmm. talk to me about how you became a war photographer is this a passion you had as a child mm -hmm. and if so were you wearing like a, a, a just a smaller hat and blazer when did this become a, a passion for you so um <laughs> I was actually wearing a small hat and blazer as a child nice. Uh, nice. I wish that I had included the photo uh, here in the slide presentation, but I it, I didn't know you were going to ask that question. You got to save it. No, that's excellent. <laughs> for next I time. For that. Um, so war photography, uh, it really all started in uh, 2008. I was working for an organization called the Juvenile Justice Project of Louisiana. I was the communications director there working on juvenile justice advocacy uh, campaigns. Um, and 2008 also happened to be the time of economic downturn here in the United States. So that meant that funders cut funding to the organization, which subsequently meant that I was let go um, and laid off. Uh, fortunately, I was given a severance. Now, the interesting thing that happened prior to the layoff was uh, about two weeks prior to that, I watched a documentary, and that's the slide that you see here uh, now, called um, War Photographer, about a prolific war photojournalist by the name of uh, James Noctway, or Jim Noctway as he goes by. Um, and it really changed my life. I was super fascinated with the concept that a single image could potentially change the dialogue and conversation around critical issues uh, and potentially change the lives for a number of people who might find themselves either in these war zones or political situations, et cetera. Um, and I found that really powerful. So I, I, I have a question about that. Of, um, <laughs> it's uh, yeah, um, I'm laughing at myself. We're just in conversation and I'm like, excuse me, I have a question about that. Um, <laughs> my question about that is, uh, I mean, that is a philosophy, right? That is a paradigm. But I think anyone who sees your work sees how technically excellent it is. So were you already a photographer? Did you already have these skills from life before you become, you know, a full grown adult who suddenly is like, oh, let's make transformative images? Right. So to be honest, I really only picked up still photography in 2007. So the year prior to me embarking on my first journey uh, to the God's Strip. Um, however, I was a documentary filmmaker since 99, 1999, dating myself here a little bit. Um, and again, I came to that craft not under any technical expertise in any way. Um, I was just a guy that had a vision and some cameras and fortunately, you know, some events led to me having the opportunity to travel internationally uh, and document like culturally relevant issues that were super important to me at the time. Um, it took me to Mount Everest, it took me to uh, all over the continent of Africa um, and all over Europe, just documenting kind of cultural uh, happening specifically around religious groups. Mm -hmm. um, so I had some experience having that type of, of, of uh, inspiration to travel, to tell stories of individuals and places that most people don't wanna go or won't have the opportunity to go. So it's always kind of been my passion as a, as, a, as a journalist, as a person who likes to tell stories, to highlight things, like I said, that folks often don't have an opportunity to, to learn about. So by the time you switch to still photography, you already had a set of ethics about journalism. I mean, would you say that you already had a set of ethics about journalism and an aesthetic of what you are capturing? I mean, so much of my growth as a filmmaker is learning like what the hell I'm even trying to get out there. So right. when you switch genres, were you already like, I know what I'm looking for? So I think that and as, as it relates to ethics, and I really want to address that first, um, for me, it came hard learned. 
Um, I always tell the story of an instance when I was in Nepal, um, documenting uh, a ceremony called a monlam, uh, which is a pilgrimage, a religious pilgrimage that people walk for uh, hundreds of miles to get to. Um, I was young, I was 20 years old. I had my Canon XL1, which was a big digital video camera at the time. Uh, and, you know, I thought I was, a, a, you know, the hotshot journalist. And I walked into a space uh, uh, that I had no business being in. Um, and the Lama, who was uh, proceeding over the ceremony, uh, scolded me in front of everyone. And in that moment, I realized, you know, you're not here to do what you want to do. You're here to sit back, learn, and listen, and, and capture this moment in a way that is, one, respectful, um, of the culture, of the people that are here, of the journey, the literal journey that that thousands of people had made. Um, and it just was a moment that resonated with me. And from that day forward, I, I always promised that I didn't want to be kind of one of those parachute journalists that just drop in uh, with no background, no care for the world, just pointing your camera at everything and, and getting what you get because you think you're entitled to it. Um, that was a, a, a tremendous lesson for me. And from that point forward, I've always tried to apply that to how, wherever my lens is pointing to be respectful of the subject matter. Even if the subject matter is difficult, if it's something that I don't necessarily agree with, I still have a duty as a journalist to abide by a specific ethic, ethical code um, uh, that allows for me to tell the story in an authentic and genuine way. I think that care and uh humanity and nuance, I, I think that's one of the signatures of your work. Um, how did, you know, how did that then ethical framework move into, you know, start us now on the journey of you carrying those lessons over into, you know, a burgeoning career as a, as a war photographer? Sure. So as I mentioned in 2008, there was a war, 2008-2009, uh, there was a war between Gaza and Israel uh, called Operation Cast Lead. Um, I had an opportunity to go uh, to the Gaza Strip at this point. Um, I used my severance to go um, and found myself embedded uh, deep in the Gaza Strip um, in, a, in, in a place that I think a lot of us hear stories about uh, and we don't really have a deep understanding of the, the, the fact that there are human beings on the other side of the story, just based on common media narratives that are told here. Um, I immersed myself there, I got there, I, I made friends, I uh, went to dinner at people's houses before I ever started pointing my camera at them. Um, I went to meetings, I just tried to really gain a deeper understanding of what was actually happening in the conflict other than the narrative that had been spoken of. Um, this work to me is very um, dear to my heart uh, because it is the first time as a still photographer um, uh, that I had the opportunity to document and try to capture the essence of what was happening on the ground. Um, the photo that I showed you here, this is actually a fighter with Izzedin al Qassam brigades, uh, which is the armed wing of Hamas. Um, and one of the things that was really fascinating to me, I'll tell a really quick story about this, this photo. I was at a, uh, a dinner for the, the women leadership of Gaza um, and a doctor had invited me over to his home for dinner afterwards. Um, uh, towards the end of this meeting, I saw uh, a group of men standing around uh, uh, the doctor whose home I was supposed to go to. Uh, and they were pointing at me and looking at me and pointing at me. And of course I was getting a little nervous. So I was like, I don't know what that's about. Um, and um, he said, unfortunately, you're not going to be able to go to dinner because they have something else planned for you. And I was like, what does that mean? <laughs> um, so I ended up getting in this car with uh, these guys and they drove me around the Gaza Strip, which is only 24 miles. Uh, you know, it's very small. Um, but they drove me around for about an hour and a half until we were kind of at the front of the war zone. Um, um, and uh, at that point, they all jumped out of the car and brought me into this home and asked me to start taking these photos, right? But afterwards, uh, the same person took me home to their house to get dinner um, and, you know, immediately took their, their, our, put their RPG down in the corner and, you know, it was kind of a stark comparison of what I had experienced that evening, uh, tailing them during this conflict, uh, because the home was filled with teddy bears and his children running up to him and hugging and kissing him. And, and you know, it was one of those moments where you're like, wow, this is also very familiar to, to the lifestyle that I understand at home, except there aren't 
bombs falling around me. Uh, there's not white phosphorus falling in the courtyard of, 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 of a playground. So it was, you know, for me, that was a, a moment that I said, you know what, I really want to be able to tell those types of stories. I think that's super important. Do you feel, this isn't the white gaze per se, but maybe it's the sort of um, American jingoistic sort of war photographer gaze. But when I, the hardest thing in my work is figuring out how to not become obsessed with white supremacists. And it's almost like there's a magnet that pulls me when you are working in Gaza and taking these images. Do you feel a gaze or a magnet on you of what you think these images should be capturing versus what you want to be capturing or what the market wants you to be creating in that scenario? Right. So for me, I never care about what the market wants, right? Like, I think that the market is saturated with information that has, has just driven specific narratives about communities of people that we as individuals won't take the time to get to know, right? So for me, my work has never been about what sells. Um, and I think that that's evident by the fact that I've been doing this work for so long. And I think maybe the first thing I ever sold was last year. So that's like a 13 year, long, you know, 12, 13 year run without ever selling anything to any major publications. Um, so for me, again, I'm not concerned about what the market wants. I'm concerned about telling stories of people who are on the ground experiencing situations that are horrible or people whose conditions are uh, uh, being dominated and controlled by specific narratives. And even if my photos don't sell at the end of the day, I'm happy to self-publish. I'm happy to push them out through social media channels. I'm happy to you know, push out through uh, smaller independent media just to ensure that these stories are also being heard. That's the most important aspect of being a documentary photographer to me. Being a photographer or a photojournalist, uh, if you're doing it just for the pay, if you're doing it just for the clout, if you're doing it just for the, you know, tear sheets, then I don't, I don't really understand how anyone could connect to your work in an authentic way. I guess my question is less about, you know, like, my question is not about like, Aziz, you trying to make that money, but my question is about, do you feel attention in the work between what you want to get and what, you know, a voice whispering like, ooh, these are the shorthands or the lazy steps of this genre that, that um, you know, you feel pressure towards. Like, like you, you know what I'm saying? Is there tension? For sure, yeah. And you just to like say- Pressure yeah. or a gaze between like, yes, right. get the horror in this way. And you have to remind yourself, no, that is not my mission. Right. Yeah. No, I just don't get the horror. Like for me, it's not about necessarily the horror. I think the horror is embedded in where, you know, the thought process behind what's actually happening on the ground when you're telling these stories. So for me, there's not attention. Like I go out and, and I say this often and it may sound woo woo, but I feel spirit driven when I'm doing this work. Oftentimes when I'm engaged in the work, like I feel like it's not even me. Like I feel like something else has possessed me, something has taken over, something has allowed for me to uh, be in the moment, not be afraid in these moments, but to tell genuine authentic stories that allow for people's humanity to be shown. And that's the most important aspect of the work for me. On that note, I've read that, that, you know, that you've used this phrase of transformative images and you know, your job being to capture transformative images. Define that for me. Well, transformative images is kind of going back to what I said about Jim Noctua. I think that if you're familiar with Jim Noctua's work, almost all of his images are transformative images, in my opinion, right? They show the horror of war, but they also speak to the humanity of, of, of the individuals on the ground experiencing things. So to create a transformative image to me means to be thoughtful in the process, be creative in the process in a way that speaks to the issue at hand, but you, in a way that you can artistically display these photos to elicit specific responses, right? Whether those responses be sympathy or just the sheer desire to learn more about what is actually happening in this photo, right? Like we can present photos that are gory, horrible all day long, and they will elicit a specific response. But I try to create images that are thought provoking, things that make you understand, connect with the subjects in the photos, um, and, and really try to feel what these individuals might be going through at that, at that moment in time. Talk to me about um, 
how that work and that lens pointed outward, pointed abroad. You know, how did you move from covering the war elsewhere to covering the wars at home, you know, in, in, in filming domestic conflict in, in America? Sure. So, you know, after coming home from some of these war zones, I noticed a, uh, a, a rise in the trend of far right activity, right? Now, we had seen it rising in uh, places like Eastern Europe and, and Europe in general, places like the Netherlands with individuals like Geert Wilders, who um, has an organization called Stop the Islamization of Europe. Um, around that time, around 2010 or so, I don't know if you remember, but there was this huge controversy in New York called the Ground Zero Mosque. Um, and the Ground Zero Mosque, uh, you know, I'm, I'm from New York. Um, it's, it's home for me. And 9-11 was a terrible, horrible thing uh, that, that I think shook any New Yorker to their core. Um, and I had to go home and document it. They were having a large rally there uh, called Stop the Islamization of America with Pamela Geller and Gilt Builders. And um, it's wild that even you mentioning this, time is so wild. It, even you mentioning this, I'm like going back through my propaganda Rolodex and mm -hmm. I'm like, right, the Ground Zero Mosque. This was before Stop Teaching Our Kids CRT. This was before trans bathroom bills. It's like, which, which one of the insane you know, moral panics from the GOP is this. And, right. and yeah, I, I remember uh, even them terming it, term, even them using the term the ground zero mosque. Yes, yeah, so, so take us back to that moment of panic that feels forever ago, but also yesterday. Yeah. Right, yeah. So, I, you know, and I think this is even a time before the Tea Party, um, which a lot of people have forgotten about. Uh, but, uh, it, you know, I, I decided to go and document this uh, rally in New York, uh, the Stop the Islamization of America rally at Ground Zero. Um, and it was filled with such vitriol and hate that it shocked me, right? It reminded me that things that I, I, I was hearing were, were extremely xenophobic, racist, um, you know, but also borderline. The, the idea that politicians were getting involved, because Good Wilders is a politician in, 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 in the Netherlands. Um, and that you know it was starting to take hold in these political movements, whether they be far right political movements, but it seemed like finally it started pushing from far right into center right, um, which was terrifying to me, which obviously is the precursor to the thing that we had an opportunity to see uh, that we'll discuss a little bit. But is the shocking part, I mean, you're, you know, you're a black man in America, you know, like, and, and, uh, and a Muslim man in America. Right. So is the shocking part because I felt the same thing, you know, from some of the folks that we were both filming in New Orleans of, oh man, this is shocking. But is the shocking part the act, watching the hate actually come out of folks' mouths? Or is the shocking part the normalization of it? Uh, well, I mean, we live that, in America. That, that, not that it is happening, but that it is gaining power and, and access to, to channels that is no longer fringe. Well, I think that the, the, no one is under the false pretense that we, we don't live in a country that's marred by racism, right? Like that's marred by hate that is literally built on <laughs> that very principle of subjugation, um, enslavement, uh, torture. Uh, I can throw all of the words out there. Uh, so America has, has its, its history. Um, I'm not shocked by America's history. I think that um, there was mistakenly um, a period of time where people thought race relations uh, or this level of hate um, would be uh, too embarrassing for most people to display publicly. Uh, what concerned me at that point um, was that people were driving that same level of, of pure vitriol that had the ability to impact people's lives, not just on a, on a, on a street level, but in a way that uh, literally we started to see policies and politicians putting themselves in place to uh, you know, take away rights uh, or limit rights or, or bring us back to an era that we, we as Americans supposedly thought was gone, right? So just to see that flare up in this way was crazy. And really quickly, I'm gonna show this video um, of me getting taken away. What happened here is uh, I was standing in uh, taking photos and someone looked at me and they said, 
he's got a beard. Are you Muslim? And I was like, yes. And, uh, and then, uh, the you're like, how dare you? But yes, <laughs> right. How dare you? Um, <laughs> uh, the crowd, uh, got very angry that a, a Muslim was standing amongst them. Um, and then, uh, started attacking to the point of where NYPD had to escort me away. <laughs> Let him cause trouble outside the gate. The trouble that I caused was being a black Muslim taking photos of vitriolically racist people. I, um, I, you know, I always, I, I love the, uh, I love it when a white man tells a white mob, let him go. You know, what, what largesse, what, <laughs> what generosity. Right, thanks for- Don't me. take his life, just let it, yeah, let him go. Let him go this time. But, you know, if he acts out, we have other- other things about, about that video you know i've <laughs> over the court you show up in our footage um you know over the course of you know four years basically mm -hmm. and you're almost always wearing the same thing mm -hmm. um so is that because you are just a right re like regularly stylish or is there <laughs> is it, it, it is there a strategy to being in a blazer every time that you are in the field? Sure. So one, my parents raised me to be in a blazer every day of my life. Uh, from childhood, <laughs> and I really do have photographs. Just coming out in your, as a baby. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> baby Aziz really does have like some fantastic, I wish I could add it now. If I could find it, I promise. I'd they are swaddling this but, brother. In <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, one of the things, it's interesting. So uh, a person told me once at, uh, that I really deeply love and respect, um, spirit actually. Um, told me uh, that, you know, when you're in these situations, what you want to do is you want to walk into these situations wearing kind of the same thing, right? Like you're putting on kind of like your armor, you're putting on your, your, your outfit that you go out and do these things in. And then when you come home, you're able to take that off, right? I also view like the way that I like choose to capture, like until last year when my life was threatened and I actually had to wear a bulletproof vest for once in the field. I really typically don't like doing that um, because I want to fit in. I want to be, I don't want people to look at me like, oh, here's the other with his, you know, UN blue helmet and press flak jacket on, right? Like that creates a specific type of like, like feeling automatically that people tend to be either like repulsed by or afraid of. Um, and I'm trying to like really talk to people. I want people to see me as myself. This is the way I represent myself. I want them to feel the, the genuine nature of my inquisitiveness. Um, and I don't want to provide any other types of barriers. So that's, uh, that's one of the reasons behind that. The part that's deepest to me, uh, looking at it, I'm like, I think Aziz does this to be safe. You know, like uh, I think, you know, in the, in the same way that, um, you know, our our forefathers and foremothers in, in the civil rights era were, you know, like we are going to do this sit in in a suit. You know, my my assumption was Aziz does this to be safe. What is heavy for me to hear is that it's not a, only about physical safety. That there's something about mental safety there of the idea of being able to take off the uniform mm -hmm. when you go home. That's um, that's heavy to hear. Right. Um, talk to me about, um, keep talking to me about the work, you know, in, in moving into Ferguson and, and documenting, uh, you, you know, a lot of this, a lot of this struggle against police brutality that we were seeing in 2014 and 2016 in a way that we hadn't seen, um, you know, moving at such a momentum. Right. So we fast forward from Ground Zero Mosque, where we have uh, people openly, brazenly for the first time in maybe a decade or so, um, in mass being racist, being outwardly uh, anti-Black, anti-immigrant. Um, and uh, then we have these spate of police shootings. Now, 
unarmed black men have been murdered by the police since the inception of the police department in the United States. So um, it wasn't shocking. However, it did feel different. It felt like kind of this watershed moment where people were rallying behind these moments in time and saying, this is it. We're not doing this anymore. We're not going to allow it. We're not going to happen. In Ferguson, Missouri, um, I had the opportunity to go there with a uh, fellow journalist, Jordan Flaherty, who also uh, was in the Gaza Strip with me. Um, and document this moment in time. Um, prior to that, I'd been in St. Louis actually a week prior to the shooting of, of uh, Michael Brown, um, visiting friends there for the first time. And uh, as soon as that happened, I decided to go back and document this moment. And I saw just one of the most beautiful revolutionary movements that I'd ever seen. I was shocked to see the, the, the willingness of that community in Ferguson to stand up against the police uh, by any means necessary um, and, and mostly by putting their bodies and their lives on the line. But one of the things that really shocked me in that moment was how militarized the area was. If you were in Ferguson at this time, uh, you would know that movement was completely restricted and it was akin to that in the West Bank of Palestine where there were checkpoints where people couldn't get to their homes, where people couldn't go and buy groceries, uh, all in favor of the idea that these looters and rioters were were so out of control that that it was unsafe for anyone to to move. So again, they were criminalized in a way that that spoke to uh, the greater issue of what happened to Michael Brown. Right. So it's it it was shocking to see and to be in a space uh, that that felt all too familiar um, from my experiences abroad. When you are taking a photo like this or a photo, you know, like the previous one, mm -hmm. you know, you had talked before about feeling the spirit and, and being in a place of calm and a place of Zen and a place of fearlessness. When you are there in your mind, are you saying to yourself, I am in a battle? Of course. Yeah, I think that I have to. I have to at least say whether that battle is physical or spiritual, right? Or, uh, you know, uh, a lot of times, and we'll get into this more and when we start to discuss more of the white nationalist work, uh, but even in this work, you know, uh, constantly being harassed by the police, going through checkpoints, etc. Like, I had to have that level of spiritual calm. Um, mm -hmm. I had to dig deep inside to not allow myself to to, to feel fear uh, in these moments where we saw uh, Bearcats, uh, which is the big armored police vehicle. And we had, you know, National Guard with AR-15s and M-16s, uh, you know, like pointed at us. There was no difference to me than what I was seeing in, in that moment and what I see when I'm abroad, especially the way that citizens uh, were treated uh, and, and corralled uh, by, by uh, institutions that were supposedly there to protect them. Talk to me about how you came to photograph white supremacists who are not also employed by the police department. <laughs> um, so uh, Confederate monuments, right? Like, I think that this is something that it had been on my heart and in my mind for a long time. Uh, I was familiar with Reverend Avery Alexander's struggle and battle to have these removed for years. Um, but then it, it really happened. Uh, I think the good work of organizations like Take Them Down NOLA uh, really spurred conversations around uh, what it means to have these monuments and these symbols to white supremacy, uh, standing over uh, a city that is predominantly black. Um, and that conversation did not cease. Uh, it was the community organizers on the ground that then led and inspired uh, Mitch Landrieu to finally uh, have some form of, of action towards it, right? Um, otherwise, I'm not certain that it would have happened. So I think that what happens a lot is that the community organizers and the folks on the ground in New Orleans who really spurred and sparked this movement over the many years, I'm not just talking about the modern Confederate movement, movement uh, removal. But like Avery Alexander, Marie Galatis, and El Basiti. Right, right. They were phenomenal and, uh, and, and moving this conversation forward, but the traction really happened starting in 2016, right? And, um, and also, I want to say that, you know, I think people, I think the national media narrative is around, Mitch Landrieu had this idea, you know, mm -hmm. uh, in conversation with Wynton Marsalis after, um, you know, after Brie Newsom was taking down that flag, 
And I, you know, I think the national conversation, you know, makes him the origin point. But I think people forget that that just days after the Charleston massacre, take him down, who wasn't even being called take him down yet. And organizers across the city were burning a Confederate flag right. at the base of Lee. We're marching. And, and you know, thinking about how, mu- how quickly the world changes and mm-hmm. what we believe to be the limits of, of the possible. I remember looking at those photos and thinking, that's crazy to burn a Confederate flag out in public. Mm-hmm. Like, like that's one thing to do it in 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 a backyard with friends, but like you you are in danger now. In the summer of 2020, that's happening everywhere, and it's like, of course, you know, like fuck the Confederacy. Sorry, right. I don't know if you need to, to <laughs> bleep right. this, but 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 were you feeling at the time watching that those actions happening that you know? Were you feeling the same sense of wow, we are on the edge of something new? You know, this yeah. is there was a danger inherent in speaking against these these symbols if you are not the mayor? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> you know, I right? was- It's so routine now people. that people are like, we threw Columbus in the ocean. And right. well, here right. too, we cut his head off. Right. And it's like, right. great. But there was this time where this was actually incredibly dangerous to even say right. Absolutely. And it wasn't just incredibly dangerous from, uh, uh, you know, the police standpoint, or it, it was dangerous for your life because we're in the bed of the Confederacy, right? Like we are in the, what, you know, on the North Shore, you know, we have David Duke, literally, <laughs> right? So we, we live in a community where uh, the conversation around the removal of these monuments was just at such a fever pitch, which I think your film does show so brilliantly, um, you know, starting from those, uh, city council meetings uh, all the way through the rallies, et cetera. Um, it, it just speaks to the level of absurdity in which people were willing to defend these monuments to white supremacy and racism. Um, I, I think that uh, it takes uh, the real champions here, the real winners, the real people who deserve all the accolades even more than I do are those community organizers who are on the ground willing to risk their lives, willing to, to, to put everything on the line to perform acts like a brazen act like burning the confederate flag which is really the best option for it itself but um you know i watched that i watched that in awe and it was inspiring to me you know like yeah we we only have 10 minutes left before we got to go to questions so i'm wondering if for this next section i I have something you can click slowly uh through these of you know i i have just a broad question about work capturing um white supremacists, and you can click however you want, even through the Houston section, but Mm -hmm. stop here for a second. So this man is in Houston, right? And he's a member of what white supremacist organization? This organization is called Vanguard America. Great, Um, great. Vanguard America, which we saw out in khakis and white shirts in Charlottesville, (laughs) yeah? So here's, so here's, here's the thing that I always, wonder specifically about this series of you know anyone who follows your work most folks most places where this photo might appear from someone with progressive politics might be look at this effing hate monger he is here in a he is driven to a city where he does not live to spread lies stand against hate right that that is a a caption that i would expect from and and that would be correct but I, I am, there is a, there is a objectivity or performed objectivity mm-hmm. in, in the captions that you, that accompany these of, that allow these folks to speak in their own words and, and judgment does not seem present in the copy. Talk to me about that decision. Sure. So, you know, I believe in journalism. I believe in ethics and journalism. Once again, I'm not trying to sway your opinion. I'll allow people to to create their own. You can create your own opinion about my subjects based on I'm just trying to provide the information and the facts. Now, obviously, anyone that can stand in my face and call me a nigger um, and tell me that they would exterminate me um, is not someone that I choose to, to side with. You know, I've been criticized by some some folks in the movement for not writing 
captions that are that way um, that that seek to you know demonize. But I don't need to demonize a white supremacist, right? I don't need to demonize anyone who is pro genocide. I don't need to demonize it because they they've done it themselves through their own actions. And for me to be able to continue to gain access to people. Um, to tell these types of stories, to provide information, detailed information on potential threats to my community, which is really around this white supremacy work, one of the most important things is making sure my community is safe. Like black people, queer people, brown people, like I want my community to know who these individuals are that have it out for them, that are looking to harm them, looking to take their rights, looking to like subjugate them and, yep. and live in, you know, the maspatory like, like fantasy of Valhalla, like white supremacy land, like these are the individuals. And the thing is, is when these- You're like, you're like so you want, you want to create a white ethno state? Okay. Yeah. What is your right. full name? Who is your employer? And what is right. your life? Perfect. Like, thank you so and much. And they give it to me. And they give it to me. So like a perfect example of that is Nicholas Dean, who was the, pres uh, the principal at an alternative school here in New Orleans, which was a completely black school, right? Nicholas like, Dean, big fan of his education work, big fan of his ed reform work. <laughs> <laughs> so this was the last, you know, like stop for children who were in the system or who had been expelled from school. This is the last place they were. And this gentleman decided to show up wearing rings that were questionably Nazi. Um, not even questionably, they were Nazi rings um, and, and, you know, a shield and a helmet at the Confederate protests. And then he's going to go back and lead a school of, of Black children? Are you kidding me? Absolutely not. So I can write about that objectively. Um, there are instances where I deviate from that because sometimes it's so mission critical to make sure that like people have the information in their hands that I don't want to necessarily just like sugarcoat it or not even be, be objective, not sugarcoat because I don't sugarcoat anything, but like I don't want to be objective in those moments because it's super important that that information is related to my community because at the end of the day, as a photojournalist, I am a servant to my community, right? Like I am a, a steward of messaging. I am a steward of stories which I, to which I'm grateful and for my community to continue to trust me and for uh, act, the ability to gain access to people, I have to be objective in those moments. Can you take me uh, forward into some of the Charlottesville photos? Sure. Okay. Uh, take, take me, take me past the video. Great. Let's let's just stop right here. So, so to be clear, you know, there have been moments, not moments, whole years recently where I've been like, objectivity when it comes to white supremacists is gone. The whole like, well, not everyone agrees that this statue should come down. Here's an old white man in a tweed jacket who's going to point to it and say that was my ancestor. Back to you, Ken. You know, like, I, I feel like around 2016, th there was this time where people, you know, journalists were wringing their hands and were like, we didn't spend enough time on the other side. We need to be objective. And recently, I've been feeling like, forget objectivity. We need to be, we need to have clarity and particularly moral clarity when filming and, and capturing photos of white supremacists. So do I, do I take you to say that you have found a type of objectivity, which is, which is just factually, what is this person saying? And can I capture that so that my community can understand what this is? Do, do you believe in objectivity when it comes to photographing white supremacists? I believe that uh, I, enjoy providing facts, right? Like, again, like I said, I don't have to put speech in the mouths of people or captions in the mouths of people or, or, you know, describing individuals for them to show who they are. Like the reason that they show me with such stunning clarity who they are uh, is because in my approach to journalism, I'm just asking the questions. I'm not being antagonistic in that moment. And surprisingly, uh, they're so transparent and so open and so loose-lipped uh, as it relates to their plans and their ideas and their ideologies that I could have never, I could have never achieved that in an interview if I had walked in uh, with a certain level of, of, of objectivity, right? Per perceived objectivity. Mm -hmm. Now, am I objective against white supremacy? I mean, to, of course, like, what are you talking about? Of course. Like, it's something, you know, like, I, I do this work because it honors my ancestors, like, and, and also, like, 
I want to root out every single white supremacist and like get them out of the picture, you know, like whether they're in, I don't mean that in like, you know, whatever FBI, if you're listening. No, but, no, like, no, I love I don't it. Mean it in a violent way, but in I the do picture mean, to get out I, of it. I need you, I need you out of the way because you are hindering progress. And anything that hinders progress, I want to show it as transparently as possible for anyone to be able to walk up to me and, and say, you were here when this photo was taken, CJ. You remember, and this is Asmodor. Asmodor is the leader of the Daily Stormer, which is a absolutely horrible publication, super racist. Um, and he's probably one of the biggest Nazis in the country and, and happily does so. This photo was taken because he, he remembered me from Houston. Um, That's what said, I wanna talk about, Aziz. He said, Leave that guy alone, leave him alone. He's with the Atlantic and he's gonna take pictures. And every, every single one of the Nazis around him was baffled and confused. But I got a certain level of access that no one was able to get at this moment. I, I wanted to talk to you. This, is, this might be a wild thing for the viewers on this thing, but you know, I think when traumatic things happen, when you, it is hard to talk with the folks that you went through that with, mm -hmm. you know? So I feel like our conversations, uh, about this event have been like, you good? Yeah, I'm good. Are you okay? You know, <laughs> you know, uh, I love you. It's good to see you again. But this moment is is one of the things I will never forget about Charlottesville of, you know, I, I went there with you. I thought my film was done. We had filmed an interview with Derwin Bunton, who was the um, mm -hmm. chief- My old boss. I'm sorry? Also, he's also my old boss. But yes. He's also my old boss. Shout out to Derwin Bundy. <laughs> we love you. Um, but, you know, we had, we were, the monuments came down in May mm -hmm. and we were filming with Derwin Bunton, the chief public defender, because at the time we thought, you know, people were still like, how is this more than monuments? No, people aren't really asking that now because it's very clear, but we thought we needed, you know, an interview talking about criminal justice and the way forward. Anyways, that interview was in August 2017. Mm -hmm. And I went to talk to you at a coffee shop in the Bywater that was, you know, where I was like, hey, can we use some of the photos that folks have seen in this presentation of, of some of these flaggers? And you told me, yes, I'm following some of those folks to Charlottesville. Mm -hmm. That is how we ended up in Charlottesville. Yeah. Um, the things that I remember most viscerally are one, the uh, not bravado, but the surety in your own body with which you would just disappear into the night <laughs> as we are standing on a giant football field where hundreds of these guys are lighting their torches and barking and saying strange Viking, white supremacist, straight up Nazi stuff. Of uh, I remember you would say to me, hey, I understand if you're not comfortable with this, I will be back. And, you know, I will always think about the you slipping off into the dark and being like, what is he doing? And then the other thing that I remember is us walking next to these folks. And mm -hmm. side note, you know, I want to get to something, but side note, when we were walking next to this line of people and it seemed like the path is getting narrow and journalists are falling back. I know you said that you're fearless, but was there a moment where you were like, we might die, we are in danger when we were walking with them or were you just- any, any, Anytime I go into these situations, I know I can die, right? Like I'm with the worst of them. I'm with the worst of the people who like want me dead, literally, like every aspect of my identity, they want me erased. So yeah, there's always the like fear of, of death, but I don't allow it to control me in those moments. Um, my struggle comes when I come home, right? Like even just talking about this like makes me tear up. And every time I give a talk, I cry. People who have ever watched a talk are probably like, that dude's such a crybaby. But like, it's- Yeah, they're like 51 when... minutes, here comes the tears. <laughs> right, exactly. Like, like it, because this work is hard. It's hard. It's really difficult work. It's difficult to have someone call you a nigga to your face and you can't punch them in the face, right? Like, it's hard to like, like be hear these types of things about your identity and your personhood and the community that you love and adore and that you're part of, it's hard. And those moments, I don't have a choice because no one else is standing there in those moments and I have to tell the story. I have to, like, that's how I know my work is spirit driven because I don't have a choice. And in those moments, my spirit guides me and it helps me get through. So you are, as you were taking this photo, 
you are also spiritually dying inside? I, 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 was, I would say I that I'm spiritually dying. thriving inside because I feel like my ancestors are carrying me, right? Like yeah. I know that that's my shield. That's my shield. They're there. The ones who have gone through it all, the ones who have gone through things that I could never imagine going through, right? That's where that fear dissipates because I know I'm doing it for them and I'm doing it for everyone that comes after me too. And like, if I can provide any level of inspiration for that, that's what I'm here to do. That's what I'm here to do. And I'm sorry I cry every time, guys. But it's like, I don't talk about, I don't talk about it often because it's hard work. It's hard work. And if you're not willing to do the hard work in a genuine and authentic way, that uplifts community and prevents your community from being harmed. If you're in it for the fame, if you're in it for the, I'm grateful for this award, but this award at the end of the day pales in comparison to what it means when someone says, thank you for telling this story. Thank you for getting the word out there. I don't care about an award. I don't care about being in a documentary even, no offense. Like for me, it's about telling these stories and that's the only way that we move forward as a community. It's the only way my community, my, life can 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 be okay is if I know I'm confronting these things devoid of fear because I don't have the right to be fearful not after everything my ancestors have gone through I gotta be here and I gotta do what I gotta do and it's not I'm not saying everybody has to do that I'm not saying that for everyone no I think we are grateful and you are you because you do that I, I think it is also interesting to me because you know the narrative that I've written in my head, it's the most fear I've ever felt. And I didn't know that fear actually like tingles, that like fear feels like a, like a leg that is asleep, but it's sort of it crossing your face. Um, for every one of these images, I was like, Aziz is powered by the fact by being hardened as a war photographer. Aziz has been here before. And never once was I like, oh, he's moving that way because he's just powered by the ancestors. Right. You know, never once was I like, oh, while I am, while I am shutting down in this moment, Aziz is, is turning on and, and coming alive for his purpose. So I, I, I think, yeah, it's a, it's a look into where your work comes from. Talk to me about shifting away from capturing these white supremacists and talk to me about the change in your work that I think was really evident in 2020. Sure. We'll, we'll go so, for about four more minutes and, we'll, and then we'll take yeah. a few questions. Sure. So last year was like a, a, an incredible moment for me. Again, this is home, right? This is the home front, right? Like I saw my community standing up in a way that I'd never seen before. Like, the movement has been being built for a long time in New Orleans, um, but a lot of times we can be lackadaisical in terms of our engagement and around national issues, right? Um, that changed in 2016 around Confederate Monument stuff. So we started to see things start to build. One, after George Floyd's killing last year, I saw this community rally, every member of this community rally around justice. Uh, and I saw a level of fearlessness uh, from a lot of faces that I had never seen before. Um, that really inspired me, right? Because they put everything on the line. This photo was taken, this is Dawn. Dawn is one of my favorite human beings, right? Like I watched Dawn all throughout last summer, uh, put her body on the line, be at the very front line. This photo was taken on the bridge, the Crescent City Connection in New Orleans, uh, the night that the New Orleans Police Department uh, tear gassed and shot protesters with rubber bullets. Um, and this is one of my favorite images ever because Dawn, uh, the, it, it just speaks to kind of the strength uh, of, of, and the will of individuals on the ground here who are willing to put their lives and their bodies on the line for justice. Again, these are all moments from, from this. This is, again, I guess, I'm always amazed to see myself in these types of things. So people always send me photos or videos of me doing my work, which is how I have this like large compilation. But here you can see me out front, um, just taking pictures of 
casually as everyone else is running from being tear gas considerably in the past couple of oh past couple of seconds and now we have just seen something uh, oh that was getting close to me uh I was just like, let me keep taking pictures, right? Because this is a moment that was so important to document. I couldn't run away from it. This what officer you want said- people to remember about this night? What I want people to remember is that a group of people were unjustly tear gassed and shot with rubber bullets by people who were supposed to protect them simply for trying to cross a bridge, right? And then we were told afterwards, well, you better be glad that you didn't get across the bridge to Jefferson Parish because you'd be dead. Okay, like this photo speaks to everything. As I was taking photos, this is the photo that I was taking in the video that I just showed you. And this police officer is telling me, I'll fucking shoot you, get back. And I didn't move. Cause if you're gonna shoot me, shoot me. I'm gonna tell the story no matter what. What I want people to remember is this community is powerful. Our community is powerful. Louisiana's community is powerful. We have people who are willing to put their lives on the line when it comes to injustice. And those are the people who deserve these awards. Those are the people who should be honored. Those are the people who should be in bright lights. Not me. Like my work is about my subjects. My work is about the people who are actually on the ground experiencing these moments. And while I'm grateful, I am grateful. I don't ever want their voices to be lost in this, ever. And I feel like for me, it's my ministry to uplift them and to give them a platform and to show them in their glory and beauty, so. Can you turn the controls over to me so I can just share something real quick? Yeah. Um. Um, as we are just in this last little bit before we take questions, I want to I want to dig into something that something that you just said. Um, talk to me about. I think some of your most. gut-wrenching work is up close portraits of white supremacists and the ones that, portraits that are not only incredible for what they capture, but because for what they've done, you know, that the amount of white supremacists that have lost their jobs because, you know, you- Sorry. They showed their face and you took a photo of it. Um, that I think they have a place in history for that reason, but I think the ones that, make me cry and, and I think the ones that will have the the largest saying power are photos of resistance and joy and legacy so can you talk to me about you know you were just talking about hey the folks who who sh should be getting these awards are are the folks on the ground in New Orleans you know putting their bodies on the line talk to me about what it means to develop an aesthetic that is about showing moments of resistance. Right, so, I mean, this is kind of the fuel that like brings me back from teetering on the edge, right? Like when I'm out and in a space that is so hateful, then to come back and see the resistance on this side, on, on the side that I agree with, right? Like, like it's empowering. It's empowering, it's beautiful, it's enchanting. It, it allows for me to, to tell the story from the other side. And there's nothing more beautiful than capturing people in these genuine and authentic moments because I don't pose people. None of my, none of my photography is posed. I'm not really into posing. Um, I try to capture people in this moment. And I love this photo, CJ, that's on the right specifically because it's also in your film. This moment is in your film where he's standing in the neutral ground, right? like with his fist raised, like fuck your Confederate flag, like, like, like brazenly in front of a group of people who are holding assault rifles, right? And he doesn't- Or even from there. <laughs> or like, where are you from? New right. Jersey, Oklahoma. Right. We, we drove right. in to, to thwart local rule. 
Right. Like, so to me, that is so fantastic. Like, how can I not like want to capture and document those moments in time? And, and they're really the, the MVPs here. Like I said, I, I, I think it's important to show that though. A lot of times the message gets lost because of, you know, okay, here are these white supremacists, but also what's going on with the community? What are they doing? How are they living? The gentleman on the left, this is the day of the removal, right? For Robert E. Lee, for Lee, at Lee Circle. And like the atmosphere, if you were there was electric. It was like being at a, at a, at a concert. It was like being at the block party. It was like everything like that you could double imagine. Double Dutch, so people exciting. cooking, people, people double dancing. Dutch, everything. It was a celebration. It was a community celebration, and like kept capturing him in this moment, like dancing with a beer in his hand, right? That he got from the Exxon station, right there. Like it just was a moment of jubilance and beauty that like speaks to who we are as individuals, like in our community and what we're capable of when we join together in this fight together, when we put our souls and our lives and our hearts on the line, and like then we can achieve victories, even though we know that just the removal of Confederate monuments isn't necessarily something that like is going to change the world, but it changed our world that day. And it inspired people and it moved us in ways that are, are, are bigger, that have stayed with us, that are bigger than we can ever, ever, ever express. So yeah, that's, that's why I love photographing these portraits of resistance. And, and that's why we love you and that's why you're winning this award <laughs> i mean i had nothing to do with it but but i'm just grateful to grateful to talk to you i mean my my last question is um you know i look at both of these moments and both of these moments are moments that i do not think are part of the official history <laughs> you know i think people think about that day and they think about the images of lee coming off the pedestal maybe lee getting carted away they think about the image of Mitch Landrew giving um, his speech, which was a good speech, but you know, they, they think about sort of this top-down uh, view of history that, that everything else sort of becomes ephemeral, ephemeral and, and, and flies away. But what I love about your work is it captures these moments of joy and resistance that are otherwise lost to memory. Mm -hmm. I, am stunned and undone by the work that you did. You know, I, I mean, it was on the cover of 64 Parishes of the, the slave rebellion reenactment that Dred Scott and Antenna and a number of other organizers, you know, created around this reenactment in 2019 of the 1811 German Coast Uprising. And we don't have time for it, folks. Google it, 1811 German Coast Uprising but it's the biggest slave rebellion or rebellion of enslaved people that has happened in American history of, of a group of uh, enslaved people who rose up, not just to run away, but to kill their masters, march down to New Orleans where everyone, where all you know, their white masters were drinking and carousing and fight them to end slavery in Louisiana and in the entire country. Mm -hmm. This was reenacted. You took these photos. And when I look at these photos, there is something to me that feels like getting back a piece of our past that is missing. Mm. And there is something to me when I look through the themes of all of your work to see the ways in which folks are, are weaponizing and gaining strength from the past. What it means to march to Lee Circle holding a giant printout of Avery Alexander being choked at the White League monument while behind him, David Duke is giving a speech. This, this feeling of, of grabbing pieces of our history and using them in this moment. And I cannot not compare the images of, of armed resistance that you captured in 2019 with also the images of the Not Fucking Around Coalition. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question is, as our memory is short, as things slip away from us, what is it in these images and what is it about this span of years in New Orleans, in Louisiana, that you want us to hold on to even if the official history books do not? I want you to hold on to these warriors. That's what I want you to hold on to. I want you to hold on to who these people are in these photos. The slave reenactment, rebellion reenactment was one of my favorite things to, to, to photograph 
not just because of the content, but because of the way that people who were playing these roles connected to the roles. We were all, everyone that was there, again, this is another moment, they were in it and they felt it and they understood the importance that their, of, 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 you know, the decisions that their ancestors made to make this. There were people who were descendants of the actual enslaved peoples who were part of that rebellion, who got to portray their relatives. Like that's special, that's important, that's beautiful, right? Like those are the things I want people to hold on to, hold on to the joy of these stories. As much as these stories, a lot of my work covers so much sadness, but also hold on to the joy that exists within the hearts of the individuals who are doing this, who will not stop, let anything stop them. Those are the people that need to be honored. Those are the people I want to be remembered forever. Like remember that no one will ever be able to say that Louisiana didn't resist. If we go all the way back to the, the, the German Coast Rebellion up until now, we still have protests happening in the city on a regular basis, whether it's against City Hall being in a historically important and relevant space such as Congo Square, you're all individuals who are making a difference when you make your voice heard. And not everyone's gonna get out and march. Not everyone is gonna get out and take war photos. Not everyone is gonna get out and make a documentary. But what you are going to do is be a member of this community that cares. And that's the most important thing. When we speak together, our voice unified, we can do anything. And I really genuinely believe that. Whether that's, and, and it, doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean that our condition or the, the, the result will be what we want, but at least we can die trying. And that's ultimately at the end of the day, what I want people to remember. Find that power inside of you, exalt it, nurture it, cultivate moments and, 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 and history. That's what we can do. Freedom or death. Freedom or death, man, always. Yeah. Um, time for 2.5 questions. Related on this issue of um, resistance, one of our um, uh, respondents, Aaron, is asking, um, and I'm gonna paraphrase here, but you know, we see even now a resurgence around Confederate symbols, right? And uh, SPLC has estimates that there are over 2000 Confederate monuments, memorials, street names still up in America, many of which are still standing, uh, you know, shout out to Lusher Charter School, uh, many of which are still standing in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. um, do you have thoughts in this moment, as we are trying to battle the white gaze, as we are trying to not center the Confederacy, do you have thoughts on how all of us can continue to call out the hypocrisy of Confederate reverence and uh, and and uh, push back on this movement around Confederate symbols. I think that's we hold our legislators' feet to the fire and our politicians, right? Like they're the ones who have the decision making, pro the, the ability to move here and make things change, right? Like, don't let it rest. Be that 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 voice in their ear constantly. Like I, that's the only way that these things are going to continue to happen. Because you know what I don't want to happen is to have all of this momentum from the past four or five years, and then it just goes away. It fizzles because we think we're in a safe situation because we have a different administration. No, that that, that same hate exists. Those same people are still here pushing their agenda. So the only way that we can combat that is to com continue to push forward and 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 hold them accountable, Lusher, hold them accountable. Every, you know, General Pershing, whatever streets there are that are like named like nationwide, like this has to be a movement that continues. Like we can't rest. This is not time to go to sleep because we, we've had some small victories. So. And I think it's time to remind folks that, that we are that we are watching, you know, I, 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 that, that not just New Orleans are watching, but the entire country, you know, how, how many schools in New Orleans it's very simple of, you know, how many schools in New Orleans are going to have Black kids returning in August to schools still named after somebody right. who would have had them enslaved, or in the case of Lusher, specifically designed schools as a way to promote segregation and white supremacy. And, you know, like, right. Right. it's just the, the deadline's August, friends. How many days do we have left before school? And is your name, is your school still named after someone whack? And, and how are you going to be able to justify that to the Blacks 
parents and families of your school. Um, right. I, I mean, it's just, I'm so, oh, sorry, go ahead. I'm just yeah. saying, it's ridiculous. Change it. Like, there's no excuse. If you are a Nazi sympathizer in my book, so. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I'm thinking of the moment in the beginning of our uh, movie of Sandra Hester standing up in city council going, what are we even talking about? Why? Right. Like, exactly. Talking about exactly. Like, why is this a conversation? Right. Yeah. Um, okay. So, uh, you know, one that we're all wondering is how can, ind thank you, Shelley, how can individuals contribute to slash support Mr. Aziz's work personally. Do not be shy. Where can we Venmo you? Where can we go to try to get you exhibitions? If people stand for your work, how can we support you? I don't, I don't, I don't need, I just need people to believe in the work. I don't necessarily need financial support. Okay, but but so I, I'm grateful for that. I'm like really us, grateful. There's okay, so they're like people who made Patreon for Venmo. Like what stuff. is the way, like, second to giving us your Venmo, like, we get that you support the work and we get that you want, you know, everyone, the, everyone in the streets to be the awardees. But for those of us who are like, this is the most urgent work that I am looking at, I want to support this work and help get this work to other places. How do we share, do that? Connect with me on Instagram and share my posts or Facebook and share my posts. Um, you know, like to me, that's the most important thing that anyone can do um, is just tell, like help amplify the voices of the people's stories who, who I'm trying to tell. To and, me, on that's, both of those, and on both of those platforms, you are at Photo Aziz? At Photo Aziz, yep. So it used to be at Photo Aziz 504. It is no longer at Photo Aziz 504. It is now just at Photo Aziz. Photo is these world, baby. Um, last <laughs> question. How or you can visit my website as well, which is photoaziz.com. Love it. Um, how I'm gonna I'm gonna add a second part onto this because it's our closing question. The question is: it is clear that you are destined to do to do this work. Not a question, I agree. It is clear that you are destined to do this work. How do you take care of yourself to ensure longevity of both your life and your career? And the part that I will add on to it is not only how are you thinking about longevity, but what advice do you have for those who are moving against white supremacy every day for making sure that they stay intact and 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 that their story stays intact and healthy? You cut out for the last part. Can you just ask the last question one more time? How are you taking care of yourself? Yeah. What advice do you have for everyone who's moving against white supremacy daily for taking care of themselves? That's the last question. Okay, uh, you know, it's it's spiritual based, right? It's also surrounding yourself with people who genuinely and authentically love you, not for uh, uh, what they can get out of you, but because they genuinely love you. Um, I feel loved and respected and nurtured um, in my life. And I think that that plays an important role um, in terms of self-care and preservation. Um, I also take breaks occasionally from social media, which I think all of us should do. Uh, because it just is a little daunting sometimes. Uh, I think it's important for people to understand their limits, right? Like when you reach your limit, if you're doing this type of work, if when you reach your limit, take the break. Because if you don't take the break, it will break you. Um, and yeah, just stay, you know, I'm a spiritual person. So that's a major part of my life as well. Um, and yeah, just believe in yourself, believe and know that you're on the right path with the work that you're doing and do that in a fearless way that doesn't doesn't harm your your mental well-being. Aziz, thank you for this time today. Thank, thank you. you for, thank you for the work that you do and the way it all makes us all freer and all feel seen. Um, so honored uh, to be even at this watching you receive this award. <laughs> I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna hand it back Bye. to Aaron Greenwald. If you would like to see more of Aziz's work, you can see him at photoaziz.com. He's on the platforms at photoaziz. And if you have not yet seen our documentary, I hope you see it. But specifically for this, watch the film. A, he is a star in this documentary. The documentary is called The Neutral Ground. You can view it by paying for it at AFI Docs today for the next two days, or you can just wait and hang out, and it's gonna be free everywhere in the country on PBS July 5th. Um, and, uh, and I think it only builds more on 
this conversation of, of what Aziz is doing when he's out there in the darkness uh, mm -hmm. and bringing things to light. Thank you so much. And I'm going to turn it back to Aaron Greenwald. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you guys so much um, for a, a really passionate conversation that I hope people, um, I hope it leads some people to greater understanding of, of what it's like for different kinds of people um, to be in this world right now and what it means for us to have the responsibility to be responsible consumers of, of media and um, really open to hearing the kinds of stories that Aziz and CJ are, are telling right now. Um, we hope that you'll join us again on July 9th when we resume Bright Lights Online. Um, we'll be talking with historian Andy Horowitz, whose book Katrina, A History, 1915 to 2015, is the LEH's Humanities Book of the Year. He will be in conversation with longtime New Orleans-based journalist and now editor of the Louisiana Illuminator, Jarvis DeBerry. Uh, that'll be another great conversation. You can register for that and future Bright Lights Online programs at leh.org. And please don't miss the Neutral Grounds nationwide debut on Monday, July 5th on PBS. Um, I had a chance to watch the film this weekend and I highly recommend it. Thank you everybody for joining us and see you soon.